We're up here on top of Mount Marcy, just waiting for the sun to rise. Day two of the Northville Placid Trail is in the books. Well, life doesn't get much better than this open ridge walk on Jay Mountain, and we're at the summit of Lower Wolf Jaw, our eighth high peak of the day here on the Great Range Traverse. Well, it's 4.30 a.m., heading a big slide today, and it's negative four degrees here at the parking lot. Bushwhacking our way up Green Mountain, and I have to say, the trees are winning this fight today. Well, the sun is shining and the wind is whipping here up on Haystack. Next stop, Saddleback Cliffs. Cock-a-doodle-doo from the summit of Roostercombe. Scarface might be the most underrated hike in the entire park. 60 mile an hour winds up on Hurricane. Very fitting, cruising up the Bald Rock Slab here on Bald Mountain. Standing up here on the summit of Catamount Mountain, Iroquois, Mount Van Hovenberg, Skylight, Santanoni. You're listening to the 46 of 46 podcast. The winter season is here, and with that, many people will be venturing into the mountains for a snow-filled adventure, and often for the very first time, and I cannot blame them. Winter hiking has a magical quality to it. The views at the summit, they're even better than they are during the summertime as that fluffy Dr. Seuss-type snow covers the mountain landscape. Climbing mountains in the dead of winter with sub-zero temperatures brings a unique life experience and it's one that most humans will never experience for themselves. They'll just see your pictures. Every time I get to a summit and I look around, I'm always left in such awe of what I see. I constantly think to myself, man, look where I am. And in the winter, no less. We're not supposed to be up here right now, but yet here I am. It's amazing. The satisfaction climbing mountains in the winter brings more satisfaction than it does in the summer, in my opinion, due to the difficulty that it brings. Over time, winter hiking becomes completely normal, too. The snowshoes, the layering, the food choices. But it takes time, and it takes building up your abilities and building up your winter experience over time, hike after hike. Preferably starting with small mountains and working your way up little by little to learn the ropes, to find your snow legs and dial in your own personal layering needs because we are all different when it comes to layers and sweating and how hot we run winter hiking is not something to dive in head first think of it more as a dip your toes in the pool first type of activity you build up your skills in a linear fashion before venturing deep in the high peaks or up any big remote mountain wherever you're hiking with the recent devastating story of Emily Sotelo, the 20-year-old girl who died in the White Mountains recently that made national news, along with the 19-year-old last weekend here in the Adirondacks who was just a mere minutes away from impending death via hypothermia while on the summit of Algonquin in waist-deep snow before being rescued just in the nick of time by the rangers, it only felt appropriate to do my part to help spread some information to help limit these sorts of stories the best way that I can. So on the 46 of 46 podcast, I am going to dive into all things winter hiking preparedness. Think of it as a winter hiking 101 in the Adirondacks and beyond in audio course form. So grab your pen and paper and take notes if you want to absorb this information. And I'm going to begin from the ground up and I'm going to discuss everything from proper clothing to equipment to water needs to researching your hikes to hypothermia to frostbite, avalanche, spruce traps, emergency gear. This is going to include it all. So let's dive right in right here on episode one of this three-part series, starting with the very first step of the workflow. One that happens before you even get to the trailhead, before you even leave your house. Researching your hike. There are a lot of elements that come into play before you hit the trail, and the more research someone does, the better. Summer hiking requires doing your homework beforehand, so you should plan on even more homework for winter hikes. Because let me start right off the bat. These mountains do not care about you. I say it often. And it's true. You must respect them or you will be put into your place. And that is a place you do not want to be put. So as we do our homework to begin our hike, the first assignment is weather. The day of and the days before. Find out what the conditions will be the day you're going to hike and what they've been the week leading up to your hike. 
Did it snow that week? How much snow? Did it rain? Will it be snowing or raining the day of? You know, rain and snow create very different conditions out there as rain turns to ice and then snow covers the trail. Very different, very important to know ahead of time. The reason for this research is because in the snow, conditions change day to day and it makes the climbs very different. Whereas in the summer, it's not so much the case outside of, you know, rain and river levels and that sort of thing. If there's been a lot of snow that week, you may be breaking trail. Are you physically prepared for that challenge? Are you also confident in your ability to find the trail that you're trying to break? It's not so easy in the winter when everything's covered in fresh snow and trail markers aren't so visible where there are trail markers. The woods can all look the same when snow covered and on an unmarked trail or trails with sparse trail markers, you could easily be climbing the mountain completely off trail without ever realizing it, which leads to other sets of issues. So it's important to look at the weather forecast leading up to your hike so you know what to expect. Trails can be broken out one day and then covered the next. And in all honesty, if it's snowing hard the day you hike, your own footprints can be covered by snow on the way back down the mountain. I've had it happen many times. Another item to be aware of, just because you're following a trail in the snow made by hikers before you does not mean that you're on the actual trail. Who knows if those hikers before you had any idea where they were going, right? It's easy to literally follow in their footsteps, but it's not always a foolproof path to the summit. So be aware of that. Moving on, your next weather-related homework assignment is to find out the temperature. A 30-degree day is a whole lot different than a zero-degree day. It's also a good estimate that the temperature at the trailhead will be at least 20 degrees colder on the summit. So keep that in mind when you're planning your layers. But, you know, we'll talk about layering shortly in this episode. By looking at the forecast the week leading up to your hike and the day of, you'll be in a much, much better spot to make better judgments out there. It's all about making good decisions. There are plenty of websites, too, that you can find weather conditions on mountains. A couple of them are windy.com, W-I-N-D-Y, windy.com, and mountainforecast.com mountain-forecast.com. Those are a couple that I've used in the past, but there's tons of them. And now your next homework assignment, the map. By studying the map and understanding your route and where the trails go and when they pass certain landmarks, how they skirt their way up the mountain, you'll find yourself much more knowledgeable on what to expect and knowledge is power. It's extremely important too. So, to sum up this section, it's important to do your homework before leaving your house. Know the weather conditions for the entire week leading up to your hike and study your route so that you have a good understanding of the trails when you get into the backcountry. Moving on to the next order of business for winter hiking in the Adirondack Mountains and well beyond, your clothing. All right, let's talk layers. Having the proper clothing can quickly become the difference between a successful, comfortable, enjoyable day in the woods or a day that turns deadly. And yes, seriously, I said deadly because people can and do die out there every year for these exact reasons. So we can avoid being one of those statistics by taking the proper precautions and having the appropriate layering. So let's start from the bottom and work our way out. Hello, base layers. We're going to start with a non-cotton base layer. Uh, in fact, avoid cotton at all times, especially when winter hiking. Why? Because once it gets wet, it will not retain heat, and it will also just never dry. Being wet, cold, and miles back in the woods is a deadly combination. And what we are in search of with base layers is a material that will keep you warm when it's wet, ideally, and it'll wick moisture away from your skin and dry out as quickly as humanly possible. The most common choices you tend to see in the outdoor recreation world tend to be merino wool and polyester or other synthetics. You basically can choose from a synthetic, which is cheaper, kind of smells bad when sweaty and not quite as warm, but still a valid option. I have many polyester base layers myself. And then there's merino wool, which any sort of wool I feel is the best option for warmth, smell, warmth when wet, and durability year after year. Slightly pricier, but you really do get what you pay for. And then there's also silk, which I've actually seen people use too with great success. But again, slightly pricey compared to synthetic, but again, it's another good option. 
And since people do like bold statements, here it is. I highly recommend merino wool or any kind of wool. So a good set of base layers, top and bottom, is an absolute essential. And I even like putting an additional set of base layers in my pack for winter hiking and summer hiking. Because they're lightweight, they take up minimal space, and in a pinch or some emergency, switching to a fresh, dry base layer for warmth can be a complete game changer and lifesaver. And when it comes to the summertime, if I did get caught out there overnight and had to spend the night, at least at that point, I have something to keep me warmer. And again, they take up next to no weight in your pack and next to no space in your pack. So base layers are pretty, pretty clutch. Base layers should also have a close fit to your body. If your base layer is too loose, it will allow cold air to circulate near your skin, which therefore defeats the entire purpose of the base layer. It should be pretty form-fitting, comfortable, not too tight, but it's literally acting as an insulating layer against your skin. So keep that in mind. And one last thing with base layers, it is good practice to have a light, a medium, and a heavy base layer set if, you know, money allows because a zero degree day and a 30 degree day are very different. And since the most important part of winter hiking is regulating your internal temperature via layers on and layers off throughout the day, base layers aren't quite a one size fit all item, but fortunately they're not too expensive, especially if you go the synthetic route, which again is a valid option. Speaking of money, yes, winter hiking, it should be said, it is not a poor man's sport, and I hate to say it, but that is just the truth if you want to stay alive out there. It will require spending some money. Summer hiking can involve a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, and shoes, and you just go. Winter hiking, however, is a very different animal, and it is to be taken seriously, not taken lightly, hence this whole podcast series. Having the appropriate gear makes it an expensive hobby. It just does. So just be aware of that ahead of time. However, you can rent a lot of this equipment, which is really helpful. But more on that later. So in conclusion, base layers are the foundation to your layering needs in the backcountry, and they are so important. There are many options, and I, I have synthetic, I have merino wool, and I recommend either with the nod going to the merino wool. Avoid cotton, as cotton actually pulls heat away from your skin, thus defeating the real purpose. And when wet, it's worse than even having them on. Having an assortment of lightweight, medium, and heavyweight sets will also very much behoove you, depending on the temperature. Moving on, next, let's talk about the other base layer, socks. Socks are pretty simple. Always have a spare pair, and again, no cotton, but preferably some sort of wool-type sock will do. I'd recommend anything from Darn Tough, company Darn Tough, or Smart Wool. And I'd say those are also a fan favorite amongst Adirondack hikers. You really can't go wrong with either brand as long as they're wool. Darn Tough also has a lifetime warranty, and you can literally, literally mail a pair back to them that are that's years old once they get you know a little rip in them from wear and tear, and they'll send you a brand new pair. It's crazy, but it works, and we do it. So uh, keep that in mind. Props to Darn Tough. Uh, so always have an additional pair or two, if you're like me, you carry two extra pairs of socks in your backpack, whether you're hiking in the summer or you're hiking in the winter. Being able to put dry socks on, game changer. Going along with the socks, let's talk vapor barriers for a moment. Now, a lot of people tend to wear sock liners to help keep sweat off the socks themselves so they don't get wet in your boots because wet and freezing do not mesh well in the backcountry, especially when you rely on your very feet to get you back to the trailhead. I personally have never worn any. I just wear darn tough socks or smart wool and then often brave the cold and switch to a fresh pair throughout the day. But a good thing to have in your backpack are two sandwich bags. All right, here's a little hack. Yes, two sandwich bags. And I'm talking just bags that, you know, like a loaf of bread would come in at the grocery store. And they're not to hold your Summit Sandwich Per Mountain sandwiches, though. That's not what they're for. But they can be used for that. But they're good to have if you ever dunk your foot in a river and your boot is soaked. So then your sock's going to be soaked, too, right? In that case, you change to a fresh pair of sock that you have in your backpack because you're listening to this episode of the podcast and you're taking notes. Bring extra socks. And then you put your freshly soaked foot with the fresh pair of sock on into the sandwich bag before putting it back into your soaking wet, soon to be frozen boot. This way you keep your wet boot from making your fresh sock wet also, thus helping you keep your foot drier than it would be otherwise. 
So it's a little hack. It's a great winter hiking hack. The sandwich bag, the old foot in the sandwich bag routine. But anyway, so in conclusion about socks, always bring an extra pair, maybe two. Wear some sort of a wool product. And remember, the sandwich bag trick. It is really clutch when you need it. And I do know they make products for vapor barriers, you know, this whole vapor barrier trick. But, uh, you know, a sandwich bag does just fine, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Speaking of boots, let's talk footwear. I get asked often what boots I recommend people wear hiking, whether it's winter or summer, and my answer is always the same. Everyone's feet are different. So it's really hard to recommend a particular shoe or boot because what feels good on me might feel awful on you. And instead, I offer what I use so that way people can just get an idea of what someone else has used successfully and kind of let them go from there. So if you must know, I have worn the Vask Snow Bourbon 2 boots for years, and I love them. Vask is uh, the name of the company, V-A-S-Q-U-E, the Vask Snow Bourbon 2. Uh, I've had really great success with them. They're super comfortable on my feet. They're waterproof. They're insulated. They fit my feet well, even though I did have to order a size up, but I was told that in advance, and that, so therefore that was fine. And uh, they've served me very well. And the beautiful thing about winter boots, too, is that they last many years, way longer than what you might wear in the summer because, you know, the snow doesn't really wear the tread down. So while winter boots do come with a price tag, they'll last a long time. I mean, I'm talking, you know, you could easily get 10 years out of a pair of winter hiking boots legitimately. And some people like insulated boots, but actually some people don't like insulated boots. While you're hiking, you're always on the move, you know, with much shorter summit stays than you have in the summer. So that does help keep your feet warm throughout the day and hopefully not sweating because you don't want them to get wet. Remember, wet and water and freezing cold temperatures, they do not mix. Uh, Personal preference should be made, but whatever you do, never settle on a boot. If it takes buying three or four different pairs and sending them all back when they they don't fit right, do it. If your boot isn't comfortable and it's not nice to wear, you are in for a world of hurt and you'll probably never want to hike at which case, you know, at this point, what's, what is the point of all of this then? You know, make sure your boot is waterproof too, for obvious reasons, especially if you're going the non-insulated route, make sure the boot is waterproof. You're going to be in the snow. Uh, Those reasons being that your feet will be wet and frozen, but you know, more on frostbite later. Now we will work our way up the body, starting with what goes on those winter boots of yours. Snowshoes, micro spikes, and crampons. All right, let's talk snowshoes. In the Adirondack High Peaks Wilderness, snowshoes are required when the snow depths are over 8 inches. So basically all winter long, meaning you must have snowshoes with you on your feet or on your backpack. Rangers also do patrol the backcountry, and they do write tickets for not having them, so be aware this isn't just a recommendation. Snowshoes keep you as a hiker safer, and they keep the trails themselves in better shape as well for other hikers. And because they keep you from post-holing, they make it easier to move. In case you're not sure, post-holing is when you walk in fresh snow with just boots and then you sink to the bottom, making literal post-holes all over the trail. And then when the trail freezes... It's a major broken ankle risk for pretty much any hiker who comes along the trail behind you, you know, walking through like a landmine of holes that's easy to just step in and twist the ankle. Not good. So snowshoes, I must have. And they always feel awkward at first, but, you know, they don't take long to find your balance before you really start to enjoy them. And there are tons of snowshoe options out there with the most popular around the ADK hiking community probably being Tubbs or MSR. Um, And it always becomes quite a hot debate, in my opinion, too. Personally, I have thoroughly enjoyed my Tubbs Flex VRT snowshoes. Um, Other popular ones are the MSR Evo line of snowshoes. And since in the Adirondacks, you're climbing on and over rocks and boulders, I find the plastic on my Tubbs VRTs is really good to have. But my big recommendation is using snowshoes with heel lifts because you can flip them up and now your heel is raised at an angle thus producing less stress on your Achilles tendon as you climb up and tremendously helping you climb those mountains because it's almost like, and it's almost like you're walking on stairs because your heel is now elevated. They're awesome. So yeah, I mean, any snowshoe really will do, um, you know, find what works for you, but that heel lift really clutch. Next, micro spikes. Micro spikes are especially necessary for climbing icy areas or days where the trail is very packed down without any new snow for added traction. 
Personally, in the winter, I have either snowshoes or micro spikes on my feet 100% of the hike. Walking in the snow is extra tiring, and when your foot slips with each step, these help alleviate that sensation while giving you the necessary traction to go up or down all those icy patches. Oh, and also, yak tracks are not micro spikes, and they have no place when hiking mountains, as they're not designed for hiking mountains. They're designed for, you know, walking down the sidewalk to walk your dog or some added traction when you're shoveling your driveway. They're not designed for climbing mountains. Keep your yak tracks at home. Uh, brand wise, there are many micro spikes to choose from, like anything. Uh, I personally have used Catulas in the past, K A H T O O L A, Catulas, as well as Hill Sound equipment spikes. Uh, I personally really like the Hill Sound spikes. They have a little more bite than the Catulas, but they both work well. They're relatively similar price point. Um, a quick tip too find a friend and go have these on an additional pair of micro spikes so that you have one extra spike in your backpack in case one of them breaks and can't be repaired in the woods. Sometimes coming down certain portions of the trail, it's literally just not safe without traction. So in that moment, if you do have a broken micro spike, you'll be a lot happier to have an extra pair of spikes in your backpack rather than, you know, another $30 in your bank account at that moment. It can be really clutch just to have that one extra micro spike. Another tip that I found helpful is to sharpen them at home with a file. In my opinion, sharpening them makes them more effective, especially for those moments where you really have to stomp your foot in to dig into the ice to get traction for each and every step, you know, so you don't go falling off the cliff. Remember when I said that you have to respect the mountains, and then it's a lot easier to die in the winter? Yep. Next, and finally, the crampon, which is basically a more intense version of micro spikes. These are typically used for ice climbing, and they're useful in, you know, very specific situations or climbs in the high peaks, such as extremely icy climbs on slabs and such. But ultimately, you're kind of good to go, I'd say, 98% of the time with just micro spikes or snowshoes. I find crampons have a very specific time and use and, you know, certain days where you may need them. But you could easily go an entire winter hiking career and be fine with snowshoes and micro spikes. In conclusion, snowshoes are a must. They are not a recommendation. You have to have them in the high peaks wilderness when the snow drift is above 8 inches, which is pretty much all winter long, probably November to, I don't know, April. I recommend snowshoes with heel lifts. Uh, snowshoes can be rented for about 25 bucks a day from places like EMS and Lake Placid. High Peak Cyclery rents them and plenty of others. Uh, micro spikes are also a must have in your backpack too. I keep micro spikes in my backpack from... I'd say probably October 1st until June 1st. Realistically, I always have micro spikes in my pack. So the higher up you get, the more ice there is. Yak tracks, they are not micro spikes. And crampons are nice, but I would not call them a necessity all the time. All of those things can also be rented. Now, as we work our way up the body, above the boot, let's talk gaiters. If you're not familiar, gaiters keep water and snow and debris out of your boots as they attach under your foot and they go halfway up your shin over your pants and over the top of your boot. They are a personal preference item in my opinion, but they're worth a quick mention, especially if you're wearing a water-resistant pant as opposed to waterproof. But they're worth having. They're not too expensive either, and they just they help keep stuff off of, uh, off, off of your pants at the bottom and out of your boots. Moving up the chain next, let's talk pants. Having the proper pants in the backcountry is, again, very important. And honestly, over the years, I found having the proper pants to be the most difficult piece to dial in for myself. When it comes to base layers and pants, remember, you want to regulate your body temperature and not be too hot or not be too cold. And unlike your upper body, you're never de-layering the bottom. So what you leave the house in is what you're hiking in. Light pant, heavy base layer, maybe I need to go heavy base layer, maybe just a rain shell pant only, or light base layer and a waterproof pant. You know, maybe the waterproof pants don't breathe as well, but at least with the light base layer, maybe I'll, I'll stay in a good temperature. You know, the combinations are just endless. And the goal is to find a happy medium, not too warm when hiking, not too cold when hanging. So, pants. Some people like to hike in just a waterproof shell. You are going to fall from time to time when you're winter hiking, and you'll be butt sliding, and, you know, it snows. So having waterproof or at a minimum, absolute minimum, a water-resistant pant 
completely necessary. And for the love of God, people, do not hike in denim. I have seen it with my own eyes. Do not hike in denim, pretty much period, but definitely not in the winter. Um, Straight up snow pants, they're not for hiking in my opinion. They're good for skiing, good for uh, sledding, not good for hiking. You need a different type of pant. And uh, a water-resistant pant, which is often made of similar material as you'll find like a bathing suit made out of, a a men's bathing suit, they've worked really well for me in the past. You know, if you fall down, you can quickly brush the snow off and you'll remain very dry. As the years go, I find my preferred setup is actually a lightweight base layer. And this is for most days. A lightweight base layer and a decent water-resistant nylon pants. And then maybe a heavyweight base layer for those sub-zero days. They're not a snow pant, but they're heavier than a lightweight water-resistant pant that one might hike with in the summer or the fall. Uh, personally, I wear the EMS Ascent pants, and they've, uh, they've served me very well. EMS also has a pair of pants called the Expedition Insulated Pants that have a tracking system built into the pants called the Rico Tracking. Maybe it's pronounced Reco, R-E-C-C-O. Other companies do too. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, it's pretty wild. Basically... It's a passive reflector that's sewn into the pants. It gives off a signal to rescuers in the event of an avalanche or just a missing person report. And there's no battery. So that's a a solid option for those who bushwhack to remote locations also, or if you're in avalanche country. To sum it up, when it comes to pants, it's about finding a good balance and combination of warmth with your base layer and not being too warm when you're moving, but not being too cold when you're not moving. And this takes experimentation to find out what works for you to avoid sweating as much as possible. Again, this took me a long time to truly dial in what was best for me. So it will probably take you a little bit of time as well. Maybe you'll get lucky and right from the get-go, you'll be like, oh, this was perfect. If so, awesome. Uh, Next, you want to stay as dry as you can from the elements. So a waterproof pant or a water-resistant pant is very important to have. So now that we've talked about pants, let's move on. Let's talk about mid-layers. In the three-tier layering setup, a base layer, a mid-layer, and a top layer, in the middle, we have the aptly named mid-layer. A mid-layer is a light jacket or a vest designed to take the edge off, you know, kind of like wearing a hoodie underneath your winter jacket. It provides insulation. The mid-layer should trap the warm air in against your body, but also be able to breathe and not cause you to sweat and therefore get moisture stuck inside and especially when you have a shell on on top of that because shells don't typically breathe. Now, as the old saying goes, and one that I strongly agree with, be bold, start cold. It's so easy to get to the trailhead, step out of your warm car, and then just bundle up and put your puffy jacket on, and then start hiking, only to need to shed layers half a mile in because you are way too warm now that you're moving. Unless it's low single digits, I'm typically only wearing my base layer on top when I'm actually hiking, when I'm actually moving. And then once we stop for a snack break or to look at the map, I may throw a mid-layer on, but then it goes right back into my backpack once we start moving again. Now remember, the goal is to never sweat, which again, I know, is easier said than done. As someone who sweats a lot, I get that. Uh, But that is the goal that we seek to achieve, and it's accomplished with our layering. So many people will hike in a mid-layer, and there are lots of different options out there, so let's get into a few of them. Some mid-layer options include polyester items because they wick moisture and they dry quickly. These are both very good things for the winter. Merino wool, once again, a great choice. Any sort of wool. Nylon is a lightweight, breathable, quick-drying material as well. And then one that I'm a huge fan of and probably wear the most when I'm actually moving, a fleece. Very warm and very breathable, and uh, you can get really lightweight fleeces, which I find to be clutch. And then there's also the puffy jacket, which would technically be considered a mid-layer, but I'll give the puffy its own entire section later. So these all work, and I have multiple different mid-layers for different uses in life outside of hiking too. But when it comes to hiking, however, I personally typically bring my lightweight fleece. Fleece breathes, but it helps take the edge off when cold, providing some warmth even when it's damp. I found it's a really nice in-between. But again, experiment. Try other things. Buy whatever's in your price point. Everything has pros and cons, but in the end, everything pretty much works just fine. 
So in conclusion, the mid-layer section, mid-layers provide warmth. There are many different options. None of them are cotton-based. And what works best for you will be left to experimentation with what you have and what you can afford. Some people will hike with their mid-layer on. Some will put the mid-layer on temporarily when stopped. We're all different, yet we all make it to the summit. So figure out what works best for you to stay warm enough and sweat as little as possible while hiking. Now that we've talked about base layers and mid layers, time for the third piece of the three layering system puzzle, the outer layer, also known as the top layer. So the base layer removes moisture away from your skin, the mid layer provides some insulation or warmth, and the outer layer protects you from the elements. So let's talk outer layers. The outer layer is the shell on top to keep the wind and the snow off of you. A waterproof top, more or less. And sometimes these jackets also have some insulating qualities to them. And then there's other times where people, like myself, just wear a light rain jacket shell as the outer layer. Just simply something to keep the snow off of you. So think of the top layer as the siding on a house. It's the job to keep the elements off of you and keep the insulation, or the mid layer, dry and insulating properly. Typically, people only hike with a shell on when it's actually snowing or if they're moving through thick country with a lot of snow-covered trees blowing off on them or if the wind is whipping. Can I get an amen? Anybody ever been to Hurricane Mountain? The wind is always whipping up there. But on a sunny bluebird winter day, it will likely stay in your backpack unless the summit is a little breezy, and then you'll want to put it on for wind protection towards the summit. Personally, I have an EMS Thunderbird rain shell that I always keep in my backpack, whether it's summer or winter. In the summer, it's my rain jacket. In the winter, it's my top layer. Same jacket, same job to keep the elements off my body. Other notable mentions include the EMX Vortex jacket, which I personally use as well, along with the jacket version of those pants that I mentioned earlier, the Expedition series from EMS, you know, the one that has the tracking system. There's also a jacket version of those pants. Uh, in terms of companies, though, everyone has their own version of what you're looking for, but these are just some options based on what I've personally used with success. But again, pick up what you can afford, pick up what's in your price point, and uh, from whatever stores are near you. So, to sum up the outer layer section, the three-tier layering system includes a base layer to wick moisture away from your skin to stay warm, a mid layer to create warmth, and an outer layer to keep the outer elements the rain and the snow off of your body. A light rain shell will do the trick or a water windproof jacket with some insulating properties works too. Though they're often bulky and they add a lot more space and weight to your backpack compared to just a rain shell, but do what works for you. Now, sticking with the jacket theme, let's talk for a minute about summit jackets, affectionately referred to as puffies, but more professionally known as a down jacket. The puffy is technically a mid layer, it's used for insulation, but it's often the go-to jacket to wear when you're on the summit or you take a quick mid-trail break to keep warm or grab a snack. These jackets deserve a whole section because there's so many options from material to insulation level to packability to size. The puffy jacket, it's a complicated, simple little item. But to keep it simple, because I like simple, the things to figure out and weigh the importance of for you when it comes to puffy jackets for hiking purposes are insulation, how warm they remain when wet, and uh, packability and durability. So there's synthetic down, which does a decent job keeping you insulated even when they're a little wet. And if you want to spend the money, some companies like Patagonia and some others make good goose down coats with waterproof coated feathers that do a pretty good job holding their loft and you know whatnot when they're a little wet. Many people I know use these coats and have had great success with them. They are pricey, but you know that's, of course, everything's expensive, right? If it's raining, however, no jacket will truly keep its warmth fully. But if it's a light snow or, you know, just a snowfall from the occasional tree that you brush up against, a good jacket will hold up just fine. Or you can also, you know, just toss your top layer shell on. Keeps the snow off completely. Now, when it comes to hiking, weight in your backpack is important because every ounce counts, right? These jackets come in all sorts of different weight classes and they pack differently in a backpack. The beloved lightweight jackets have pros of being light, but the cons are they tend to rip easier. Durability becomes the trade-off, so keep that in mind when finding the right jacket for your personal needs. So now when it comes to fill and warmth, I have both a 650 fill and an 800 fill jacket. 
which are both synthetic down, and I have found a very noticeable difference regarding the warmth between those two. Personally, I recommend an 800 fill puffy for the summits, and you should remain plenty warm up there with an 800 fill jacket, especially with a shell on top, keeping the wind off of you. I think an 800 fill puffy with a rain jacket shell is a solid combination to keep you plenty warm up on those summits. Now remember, if you do hike in your puffy, even with a shell on to keep the snow off, you can still get the puffy wet. This happens often when hiking with a puffy and sweating from the inside, thus getting it wet from the inside, not the outside. Personally, I don't recommend wearing a puffy while you're actually moving for that exact reason. Because I feel the puffy should be kept strictly for major warmth. So when you're hiking, a fleece or, you know, some other mid-layer is probably better. You know, when you're actually moving. And then you use the puffy as the mid-layer when you're not actually hiking. That's the jacket that you put on. To, okay, there's my nice warm jacket. Let's put that on. All right, we're going to start moving again. All right, let's pop that jacket off, throw it back in the backpack, keep moving. You know, others may disagree. and Now that's cool. But personally, I feel this is the workflow for success. Keep your puffy sacred because it can be the difference between surviving the night during an emergency or not, especially if it gets wet. So to wrap up all things puffy, you have to determine for you what is the most concern, weight, waterproof, fill, and durability. Will the jacket keep you warm when it's wet? Will it be warm enough when it's dry? Will it pack well in your backpack? Is it durable enough for the backcountry's demands? Is the extra durability worth the weight? These are all things for you to consider, and at the end of the day, the almighty price point will likely be the deciding factor. So, do what you can, and whatever you do, keep your puffy sacred. Moving on next, let's talk hat and gloves. Not a lot to discuss here, as you know, they're pretty simple items, but again, no cotton. Uh, wool keeps you warm when wet, so wool is always a good choice. Obviously, you all know I like wool. I also like fleece hats as well. Uh, and I do recommend waterproof gloves with liners and carrying an additional glove liner. These will get wet, so being able to switch glove liners is clutch on a long day in the cold woods. In fact, carry an extra hat and extra pair of gloves, period, just like you do with socks. You'll be really glad that you have them, and you'll also avoid frostbite when your gloves inevitably get wet and your hat freezes. Every company has expensive winter hats and winter gloves, but, you know, this is a category I feel you can get away with spending less, but, you know, spending right, buy the right stuff. Also, there are, you know, there are summit gloves that exist that are designed for very cold temperatures that are noticeably, noticeably better. So, you know, hard to say, but you can get away with not spending too much on the hat and gloves, but just spend right. Another item in this category becomes the balaclava which is basically a hat for your head, face, and neck all at the same time. So this is a great item to have in your pack for when you're out on those exposed summits and ledges. Also, these feel like double the warmth, in my opinion, when your face, head, and neck are connected with one piece of material. I do highly recommend having one of these in your backpack. It could also serve as your second hat that I mentioned to bring. Uh, personally, I wear a fleece one. I like fleece. But keeping your face and your neck warm is really clutch on those exposed ledges. So in conclusion, hat and gloves, no cotton. Bring extra glove liners, bring an extra hat. Waterproof gloves are good. Wool is always a good choice, and a balaclava can be super, super nice. Onward. Some other non-essentials for survival, but also somewhat essential for survival because of how useful they are for winter hiking include the always useful, ever popular trekking poles. So unbelievably helpful for balance and safely climbing up and down those icy stretches of trail too. I honestly don't know how people hike without trekking poles, and especially in the winter, although I don't feel like I ever see people in the winter without them. I feel like at that point, everybody has them. Um, in my opinion, they are a must-have. Uh, make sure you put the snow baskets on too, because that's what they're for. And just skip that whole rubber tip that they all come with. They always fall off, and they're basically useless in the mountains. And in the winter, you want that sharp edge on the bottom so it can stab into the, the icy ledges. Next, ski goggles. Good for keeping the rays out of your eyes. Absolutely crucial for keeping the wind and snow out of your eyes on exposed summits. There's been times that I've been on mountains where due to heavy wind and snow that I literally couldn't keep my eyes open without them. On a clear, sunny day, you know, they're not necessary. Sunglasses will do just fine, so they'll probably stay in your backpack. But if you're going to be on an exposed, very windy summit and it's snowing, I'd say they're worth having. 
And you don't need to get too fancy with whatever you buy either. You're really not going to wear them all day long. You'll just wear them for certain stretches. That is going to wrap up part one of this three-part series on all things Winter Hiking 101 right here on the 46 of 46 podcast. Next week, I'll get into what belongs in your backpack. I'll touch on food, give you some water hacks, and the actual hiking experience in the winter. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you gained some information that will help you be safer and more prepared when you're out enjoying the winter majesty in the mountains because winter hiking is an unbelievable experience and I recommend it for all, but I recommend to start small and work your way up and be smart about it. And I hope this podcast series will help you be ready and confident when you venture into the backcountry. Check back next Friday for part two. Head over to 46of46.com and check out the website. I have a store. I have an ebook for sale about how to climb the 46 high peaks. Lots of fun information, blogs, 46of46.com. But that will do it. See you guys next week. Remember to always leave no trace. Do the rock walk. And if you carry it in, carry it out. See you on the trails, everybody. 